Hello fellow gamers and welcome to the Lord's General YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be taking a look at this Accursed Civil War. It's a GMT game uh, designed by Ben Hull in uh, 2002. And what this game looks to do is recreate five scenarios from the English Civil War. Um, so in this game you get the battles of Edge Hill in 1642. In 1643, the first Newbury battle, and from 1644, the Marston Moor and second Newbury battles, and Naseby in 1645. And I really rate this game. It's a very good strategy war game from the Pike and Shot era. So I'm going to take you through what we've got in the box here. So first of all, we get two maps. And these are double-sided maps, so you've got the second newbie map here as an example. Uh, you've got some features on there, such as woods. Uh, there's some tree-lined roads, but they don't add much effect to gameplay. Now, this is one thing that affects the gameplay. These are hedges going all the way up here. And any units attempting to go over these hedges generally take formation hits um, to their uh, cohesion levels. Uh, so you've got a few towns marked on the, the map. That's uh, Skinner's Green up in the corner there. And down on the bottom of the map you get a turn tracker. So you can see that particular scenario goes up to 10 turns. Also get on the bottom of the, the map a reminder of how many movement points each unit has. So the cavalry and the leaders get 8 movement points, the light infantry 6 movement points and the heavy infantry 4 movement points. The artillery do not move in this particular game. There are rules for limbering um, but I don't think they are used in any of the scenarios. That's one map. That's the second map for different scenarios and the Master More map. Uh, I don't think I'll get this out. Oh, that's a interesting bit there. So you get a order summary charge. So in this game, there's four orders. So you've got the charge order, the make ready order, the receive charge order, and the rally order and as we'll see later on if you want to change orders um, what you have to do is actually roll on a chart to change a particular wings orders and depending on what order you have that dictates what the units within uh, that wing can do so for example if a unit has a charge order that means you have to move one hex closer to an enemy unit or engage in fire combat and if you're on the make ready order, you may move, but you can't move adjacent to an enemy unit. So make ready is also useful for making reform actions. So when you go over the hedges, if you get a uh, formation shaken um, status, then you can use a reform action to get that formation back to normal status. If you're on receive charge, you may move one hex only. Um, and you may also complete a reform action. And if you're stacked with a wing commander or adjacent to the commander, you can attempt to rally. Only under the rally order can units actually all complete a rally for that wing. So units may move in rally, but cannot end movement any closer to an enemy unit than where they started from. There's a small map here at the bottom there, just confirming what all the features are. And some features will have an effect on the battle, others not so. You get one ten-sided dice in this game, which is used to resolve all combats and firing, uh, cannon firing and so forth. The rule book is quite... Um, 
quite lightweight. It's 16 pages, so it's fairly easy to pick up. I should say that the complexity rating for this game is mid-range, so it's a 5. Um, I believe it's a 5 out of 10 scale. And also the solitaire rating, so if you're playing this game solo, it's also fairly good. It's a 5 out of 10. And I play all my games as solo games, playing both sides, and it's a very engaging game for solo war gamers and highly recommended. So I'm just going to take you quickly through the, the rule book, so maybe we can pick up on some of the, the features of this game and how it plays. So we've got a example of some of the tokens there. So you can see up here. Um, each cavalry unit generally has two pistols, and when one pistol is fired, it, what it shows one pistol used. And if both units have uh, both pistols have been fired, sorry, um, then it shows there's no pistols loaded. Um, if you, if a heavy infantry unit fires, they can fire via salvo to get a bonus to their firing. Uh, firing hit power and you've got some tokens have down here which show whether the morale's shaken morale's broken and as we discussed earlier sort of if you're going over hedges or if you take combat hits your formation can become broken and you'd need a reform action to try and bring that formation uh, back up There's a glossary over here to explain all the relevant terms. So there's a sequence of play here. And so it's an interesting sequence of play in this game. So what happens is generally all the all the wings with charge orders, regardless of, regardless of which side they're on, they would generally go first. And then um, it would go so forth down to rally. Now, a unit wing can actually attempt to uh, activate more than more than once in a particular round. So, if I was on a charge order, I can move first, and then I could say, actually, I want to move that wing again, and I could attempt and roll for a continuation of that wing. And I can actually do that up to two times. Um, the opposing side also has an opportunity to intercept your play. So if you are a active wing, then the opposing side may have a chance to preempt your particular mover. And if they attempt to preempt and are successful, they would then activate your wing before you could activate your wing. So it's quite a complicated. Um, system for working out the, the order of play but it's quite effective for this era it makes for some interesting battles and I think battles of this area were generally uh, very hectic so it's recreating uh, that effect quite well just looking over here in this game you have a army commander which is a single commander and you also have a wing commander and the army commander and the wing commanders can influence battles uh, in close combat. They can help reform units a bit better. Um, obviously, losing your army commander is very bad for victory points. You don't want to lose any of your commanders in this game. And you see there's a replacement table. So if your uh, commanders are stacked with a unit that comes under fire and takes a hit or is involved in close combat, you would need to roll to see whether that leader was actually injured or killed. And then at the end of the turn, you would work up the replacement. Sometimes there's a chance for your original commander to actually come back and command the unit um, that it was commanded before. Or it might be that the scenario says you can't replace it with the uh, original leader. You need to replace it with one of the um, substitute commanders. Tracing commands, it's quite a very tight command system in this game. It's sort of two to three hexes range that you have to be within another unit from that particular wing. Obviously, if you're out of command, there's certain effects you have to 
moved back in at the first available opportunity. So it's quite a tight game, this pike and shot game. So there's a few uh, diagrams here on facing. So pike and shot units are generally double hex units, whereas you could have a sort of light musketeers on their own. Sometimes there's light pikemen on their own. And cavalry units are also a single hex unit. A few unique formations. So if the large pike and shot unit is being charged by cavalry, there's an opportunity to form a hedgehog, which would... Um, prevent some damage from that cavalry charge. Essentially trying to make sure you don't have a rear flank uh, if you go into Hedgehog. There's some open order marching that's sometimes specified in a scenario but it's not often used, the open order marching. Not for this period. Um, sorry, there's a column uh, formation there as well. There's a few examples of movement here and this depicts the cavalry going over the hedge and you can see they end up with formation shaken so it's showing how they move up there use up their eight movement points there I think there's a misprint in this rule book because that shows the musketeer getting a formation shaken um, but I believe musketeers can actually negotiate hedges without uh, needing to take a formation hit and this is interesting, this shows a large unit which is backing up one hex and about facing, therefore using their four movement points up. There's rules for interception in this game, so if I move a heavy infantry unit, or any unit in fact, forward to the enemy, and the cavalry is within range, they can attempt to attack that unit. Um, they can roll on an interception table to see if they can actually attack that unit and prevent it moving any further. Stacking, generally there's one uh, unit per hex. Um, sometimes you get light infantry units uh, stacking with cavalry or you may get um, a cannon stacking with a unit as well. Uh, but they're more the exception rather than the rule. There's rules for fire combat there. As I say, cavalry generally has two pistols. Uh, the heavy infantry can sometimes fire salvo, which is a bit more devastating than the normal fire effects. So some examples there of uh, firing and who fires on who. So this manual is all black and white, which is not too bad, but it's a nice, uh, a nice thick manual, a nice heavy grade paper. This shows a example of cannon fire, looking at the line of sight and artillery fire in this game it generally doesn't cause damage to units what it will do is it will cause a formation hit possibly and possibly shake the uh, formation um, possibly give a morale hit to the enemy unit so it's all about morale and formation for these these cannon fires and what the effects are of a successful hit then there's examples of close combat and I think on the next page it is, um, there's a lot of close combat modifiers that come into play. There's a nice table that actually explains this somewhere. So I think it's on the, the next card that we see. So I'm going to get the player aid out and show you um, that close combat modifier. So this is a player aid card. Now in this game, I received one of these, but the box actually says there should be two in the game. And I've heard other players say that, in fact, they only see, receive one of these player aid cards as well. So um, it must be a common problem. Um, but to pick up that close combat, you'll see there's a close combat table on this player aid card. They're the results of close combat after a dice roll. But some of the modifiers are whether you've got the uh, leadership rating uh, nearby, uh, whether you've got a morale differential with the uh, enemy unit, how good the strength ratio is, so a 2 to 1 ratio is going to be better for the attacker um, and worse for the defender, and also the close combat matrix. So if you've got an attacker of heavy infantry, versus a light infantry, then they're going to get a bonus to their roll. If 
cavalries in uh, close combat, they can also fire a pistol if they've got a pistol available. So there's a number of modifiers there. If the cavalry wins close combat, then there's always a chance that they may actually be eliminated if they pursue the enemy unit off the map. So they could pursue off the map, they could pursue an eliminator unit but stay on the map, or they could actually break off and just let the uh, enemy unit run away. So this also covers, um, as we confirmed earlier, depending on what order you have, that dictates what you're able to do under that order. And to make the change, there's the uh, table which shows you how you can make that change. So you've got the leader replacement table there. And inside, so it's quite a uh, quite a big uh, age chart this. So you've got so four printed sides. These are all the terrain effects chart, chart to both the uh, movement points and the combat effects. And if you're firing muskets then this is the chart which will um, help show you how much damage is caused based on the dice roll down this column here. So this is a playbook and it's quite a big playbook so it's 20 pages which is bigger than um, bigger than the rule book in fact. So you see it goes through all the scenarios and it also has some designer notes, um, some historical notes as well which is nice to see and some bibliography at the back. Let's see. So again, it's all black and white, but you get a nice description of what these scenarios are all about. And setup, so it shows you who the army commander is, who the wing commanders are, which hexes the uh, units have to be set up on. And it will show you how to calculate victory conditions and also what the historical results were, so you can compare your result to the historical result of the battles. So it goes through First Newbury, Marston Moor, the Second Newbury, the Naseby. So the historical notes cover organisation. There's quite a few historical notes, which is good to see. Tactics, weapons in use. And then, as I say, the designer notes at the back now. The designer has made a very good game here. This really does set the standard for English Civil War and Pike and Shot games. And I believe this system is used for other types of scenarios throughout, uh, for games which take place throughout Europe from the same sort of era. This shows all the counters which are included in the game. So I've got some notes there which I made from previous battles, and some rule notes. So you see I've played some of the scenarios and some of the encounters are still unpunched. Let's just take a look here. I can't zoom in quite that well. Um, there's a leader there. And when a leader, so that's Lord Byron. And when a leader has finished their activation they get turned to the finish side. See some single muskets there. It's not focusing very well. There you go, that's a bit better focus. So that musketeer there, for example, you can see there on the formation shaken side, and if I turned it over, that FS would not be there. That would be the formation normal. So what you're seeing there is a strength of three and a base morale in the red colour. The uh, artilleries show a grazing range and a long fire hex range. That's how many hexes it can fire. So if it's within four hexes, it's generally more effective than if it's up to 14 hexes. You've got the markers there showing whether the cavalry pistol was used or not. And that's the damage markers. They're quite nice damage markers, really. 
The counters are pretty solid. Good quality from GMT games. Really like the quality. And these are the counters that you put on the different wings to show what order the wing is under. So, as I say, all these counters are unpunctured. There, there you go, you've got some salvo markers on there as well. Um, there's quite a lot of spare tokens, isn't there? Probably because I haven't played the, the largest battles yet. So that's one, two, three, three different uh, boards there. So quite a lot of uh, figures, quite a lot of card tokens. So I hope you've enjoyed this game. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, review and I'd highly recommend this game if you're interested in the Pike and Shot era. Uh, let me know what you think about the review in the comments section. And if you'd like to see more on this game, if you want to see some battle play or you want to see a different game uh, under review, um, please let me know in the comments section as well. And if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, I'm going to have a lot of new different games coming in and which I'll be able to review those as well. I've got some very interesting games coming, in particular a Napoleonic naval war game. So I'm very looking forward to reviewing that and very excited about that. So thank you for now. Thanks for watching.